Happy spooky month everyone, I'm Ant, and I'll be your guide around this here horror museum today. In this exhibition, we tend to celebrate the genre of horror in both video games and movies. If you have any questions, save them for the end of the exhibition and I'll answer them all. As the tour guide, I'd like to give myself a little introduction before we proceed. I'm Anti, and I've become quite the horror and enthusiast over the past year or so. Before said year, I used to frown down upon the genre and anyone who enjoyed it, thinking myself to be just superior. Those were the dark ages, I'll admit. The reason for this was that I held the view that the majority of horror games and movies were incredibly generic and predictable, but honestly that can be said about any genre. There are bound to be shitty additions to any medium. There is always hope, however. There are some hidden gems that can be found within the video game and film industry which I'll be here to share with you today. The only exception is that the genre of musical is complete trash and you can't change my mind on that. Okay, I've just discovered the wonders of La La Land and I take back my statement. Bit by bit, I've begun to enjoy various products which aim to frighten its consumer and my most memorable ones are the ones I'll be talking about here. If you follow me over here, we've got a short and sweet piece called Little Nightmares. Suitably named in my opinion, as the gameplay speaks for itself, the size dynamic between the protagonist and the enemies gives the player this sense of megalophobia, which is the fear of extremely large objects. But it's not done in the way you may be thinking, typically the villain or the monster in horror games may be larger than the player. Interestingly, however, in Little Nightmares 2, it's the player who is just unnaturally minuscule. To me, the game feels like a really freaky fairy tale, and it kind of is, as the sequel expands on the story and you learn that there are a lot of similarities between the games and actual fairy tales. This one is a personal favourite of mine and I recommend it to a variety of different people, from platformer enjoyers to indie game players. Little Nightmares 1 has inserted itself as a go-to video game for horror gamers and I had a great time with it, as well as many, many others. Surprisingly, 2 is just as good, if not better, in terms of technical fixes and other aspects, which I'll cover later. Little Nightmares 1 was a big deal on its release in 2017 because of its unconventional horror elements and concepts. The gameplay keeps the tension high at all times. As the player, you always have to consider potential hiding spots, whilst also working out different puzzles in the middle of stealth and past your presence. Predator. All the f***ed up enemies you encounter are unique in their own ways, all having their own section of the map that indicates what type of character they are. Overall, I'd give Little Nightmares 1 a solid 8 out of 10 on the spooky meter for its new take on the genre of horror. Now as for its daddy, Little Nightmares 2, it's pretty much an improvement over number 1 in practically every way, from the story to the artistic direction, even featuring a bit of character development from various individuals. In in my opinion, I think Little Nightmares 2 feels significantly higher in quality. It's like making the jump from an indie game to a triple A title. And if you want to skip Little Nightmares 1 and move straight to 2, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you do, I'd say go for it because the entire concept of this series is shrouded in enigma and I don't think you need that much context from the first game to enjoy the creepy spooks of the second game. I won't go into too much detail about the sequel, all I'd say is to try either slash both of these games out. Little Nightmares 2 will get a 9 on the spooky meter from me fellas. Moving the frick on, over here we've got Resident Evil 7. This game was uh, allegedly too scary for a majority of people, hence why RE Village was more of an action shooter with horror elements. This bad boy however is definitely frightening, especially in VR which is what I wanted to discuss. Released in 2017, I played Resident Evil 7 on the PlayStation VR even though I had already completed the game. However, this was a great move, as I've not felt that type of fear from a video game ever before. If you haven't played this game in VR, YouTube videos can't do it justice to how scary it is. An example is, at the start of the game, when you head down to the basement and hear Mia's breathing before she squares up to you. Whilst this scene is originally really creepy, it's a different, different experience in VR. It looked like Mia was directly in front of me, noses practically touched 
searching, and trust me, you do not want to be that close to a demon Mia who's all pale and veiny, looking like she's just smoked a ton of crack, basically. While Village does have its moments and is, in general, a fun and interesting shooter title, it doesn't hold a candle to how terrifying RE7 was, which is why I'll give it a 9 out of 10 on the spooky meter. I'd like to quickly divert to this little piece over here called Outlast 2. Shout out to this game because it scared me so much that I quit the game and never played it again. The camera battery feature is implemented really cleverly, meaning the player must think ahead and weigh the pros and cons of turning on the camera as it's the most useful tool at your disposal. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the Outlast series has a camcorder that you can pull out at any given moment and turn on the night vision so you can see what's in front of you. You can never really predict what sort of enemy you'll face, so turning on the camera means it's pretty much a gamble and a frantic search for more batteries. For me, this game was way too much on my mental, but hey, if this video gets 10 likes, I'll give it another go for a video. Moving on, we're going to finish this exhibit with a little crossover into movies. Whilst this isn't my specialty, I still wanted to give a shout out to some horror films I've really enjoyed in recent memory. Those two are Midsummer and Hereditary, unsurprisingly. If you're a horror enjoyer, I'm certain you've already heard of these babies. They're highly respected in the horror community from all the praise I've seen so far. This isn't a huge shock though, because these films are really, really great. I'd like to lightly touch upon both of these, starting with Hereditary. This film has a really eerily normal feeling to it throughout, despite there being really f***ed up occurrences happening constantly. That's what it felt like to me anyway, and the reason for that is because of the acting. The film focuses on a normal household that witnesses a tragedy. Basically, Hereditary is about a family that attempts to escape from their haunted past, but supernatural events occur all around them, and they slowly start to collapse and go insane from it. It feels like a really grounded movie for the most part because of the exceptional acting performed by the cast. It was performed so realistically that this feels like it could be a real-life narrative with the way the family reacts to these things. Besides that, Hereditary has some insane gore and terrifying visuals. As for the second film, Midsummer, I have quite a lot to say about it. I'm going to cut to the chase though and say that this is the superior movie in my mind and I've got quite a few reasons for it. But because this isn't a review video, I'll try to condense it down a tad. Midsummer is a strange horror film because it doesn't attempt to scare you in the traditional ways that's typical of the genre. It holds a priority on narrative, not giving into cheap jump scares or just generally showing disturbing imagery for the sake of it. One aspect of this film that was noticeable to me was its cinematography. From the lighting to the camera shots, it all felt like it had a purpose behind it. It's an extremely beautiful movie and one of those products that feels like it should be displayed in an actual real life museum, not this figment of my imagination museum. Uh, someone please frame Midsummer up right beside Da Vinci. What's even crazier is that these two films are both directed by the exact same person, Ari Aster. GG's to him because it's a huge accomplishment that he's directed two of the best modern horror films, especially considering how difficult it is to create one singular good horror. We've reached the end of our exhibition here, dear friends. If you have any questions, make sure to put them through our customer concerns section underneath this video. That's all I've got for today, but I've got some really fun projects I've been working on which I can't wait to upload and show you guys. Thank you for joining me here, and I'll see you fellas in the next one. See ya.